Long pointy sticks. Uh, got you right here. Pole weapons. Hmm. Proper name, hafted weapons. Why is that the proper name? Because not all of them are poles, but they're all hafts. Uh, a haft is simply a long handle. Uh, what was the first pole weapon? A stick. Um, then somebody took the... Oh, he's got it. It was laying down here. I don't want to step on it, okay? I, somebody's prop... I, I've got no reason to break somebody's rice bowl. The stick extended the reach of man. The original application of the stick was a club, but we already talked about impact weapons. Now it evolved into a piercing weapon. And what was that involved in? Uh, it allowed you to kill game animals larger than you, and you get to eat them, you get to increase your protein content, which makes your brain work better, uh, which is really important because we are lousy survivors in the wild. We have blunt teeth, uh, we have no claws, we have no armor, so we got to outthink the sun bitch. Well, high protein diet makes the brain work better. The killer ape was one who could eat meat, so you want to get it. So you evolve weapons to make your reach better. Now, somebody found out that if you take the end of the stick and burn it in a fire and then scrape it, it's sharp and hard. It's called fire hardening. So the stick is the first ranged weapon you can throw. But the spear evolves from the stick. And it's amazingly sophisticated. I mean, it's a spear, right? It's a sharp thing stuck on a pole. No, it's so much more. Here is a fletched arrow. It's a spear. What's the difference? It's thrown with an atlatl. Hmm. See atlatl. Mm -hmm. And you would hold it here, and the spear would go there, and you'd throw it and get like half again the range you would with your arm. Why? You just made your arm twice as long. This came in all different sizes and shapes, and could be used, God, those are sharp. <laughs> uh, could be used with all kinds of spears. This classic spear, I mean, from Greek to today, is where, is here somewhere. There it is. With the rounded head. The Viking spear was a bit shorter. The classic Viking spear simply had a more square head. I mean, this style was used from the Greek days to 400 years ago. The Viking one, a little bit more square head. It cut better to them. Also, it's a bit shorter. You can thrust better with it. The ultimate thrusting spear, the one you get into the guy, okay, is the Zulu Ikleva, which I probably horribly mispronounced. If you know how to speak Swahili, good, you do. Um, this one, you work with a shield, use the spear, and you get into the guy, and you're thrusting with it. You step back, and you can actually throw it. But the way you get penetration is velocity and weight. Uh, it's a thing called cross-sectional density. The higher the cross-sectional density, the better the penetration, given everything else being equal, which means the pointy part. This means a heavy long spear has a higher cross-sectional density because the cross-section is the same, but it's longer, more weight. More weight drives it in. Then again, higher weight spear, harder to get the velocity in there, so it doesn't go as far. Iklawa, a trade-off, designed for close combat. If you see the movie Zulu, you'll see this thing used a lot. Um, actually, by Zulus, by the way, they were extras for the movie. The um, Winged spearhead is, uh, in some cultures, this is the symbol of Odin. Um, it's a great big uh, Norse mythology thing. Plus, it's better to hunt with. 
Why is it better to hunt with? Have you ever met a boar? <laughs> <laughs> now, you're going to kill it with a pointy stick, and it's going to be pissed. It's a chunk of muscle with four inch long teeth backed by a chunk of muscle and a bad attitude. It's going to come up that stick and eat you <laughs> if it doesn't die first. And you got to convince it to be dead. The wings keep it from coming up. Mm. They also allow you to be using a spear for thrusting, and it won't go in so far. Because, I mean, could you step up here? I'm not going to hurt you. I'm the target. I'll turn around. No, here. not really. Turn, turn, turn. This way. Mm. Okay. Big guy. I got a nine inch long spearhead. Where can I hit him and not hit something good with nine inches? Why do I have to have something 30 inches long and it's going to stick out his back and get the next thing? Thank you. <laughs> I don't. Um, but my weapon could be hung up in him. And note I used my weapon. That means I'm standing here going, I'm up Shit's Creek, he's going to kill me. Mm. Or his buddy is. So that's the evolution of these kind of spears. The black bladed stamp metal one, this is a boar spear manufactured by Cole Steel for the people who want to intentionally go out there and piss off a pig. <laughs> yes, it's my spear. No, I'm not killing a pig with a damn thing. I almost took out a deer though, just because. You know, I'm like, you're eating my lawn, no shooting. Yeah. Um, now, I talk about sophistication, right? When was the most sophisticated spear invented? 100 years ago? 300 years ago? 1,000 years ago? Going to go with the pylon? 2,000 years ago. 2,500 years ago. The Romans invented the pilum. Mm. There are more things wrong in the stories about this spear. But again, its form follows function. It happens very often in weapons. Now, I've already told you what cross-sectional density is. Look at the size of that point. Okay. Smaller diameter shaft following it up. Nice heavy stick. The fact that's in here means this is all the metal and this can be made on a run. Mm -hmm. It's armor piercing. It's got a hardened tip, a soft body so that it doesn't shatter, just like a sword edge, but that small tip will go through a shield. The high cross-sectional density means it keeps going through the shield until it gets to the guy on the other side, which is why this is so long. Mm. This is longer than the average person's upper arm. Okay? 2,500 years ago. The Romans being... Okay, this model was... 1,800 years ago. Pardon me all the help. <laughs> um, but they're going to improve it. Now, what was one of the advantages? This is the thing that form follows function and legend follows function. Hit the spear, hit the, I'm nailing in the shield. It's going to, I've gotten rid of it. But it's going to fall away. You're holding the shield up because if you don't hold the shield up, I'm going to kill your ass. And it bends. Which means what? Can't You've lost it. your shield and you can't throw it back because it's bent. What makes this better? Jack up the cross-sectional density. Add a big iron weight to it. <laughs> this is the weighted pillow. Um, this one's circa 50 to 300 AD. Oh, I'm sorry, I misread. It's been a long day. 300 BC to 300 AD. So yeah, 2400 years. And it's a spear, and we haven't gotten better. Because when you reach the pinnacle, that's why they call it a pinnacle. <laughs> you know, it's really about as far as you can go. Mm. But you can go so much further with other hafted weapons. The last issue spear. What was the last issue spear? World War One. still issued. Yeah, it's <laughs> the lance. The Brits use it. This is an 1863 model lance. 1863 actual issue lance head. 
and you use it on horseback and they use it in the guard and they actually carry it and yes it's sharp enough to shave with um, they do all the lance stuff with it but it was invented a uh, hundred years ago the final design came up a hundred years ago um, it's bamboo one of the reasons for the bamboo is so that you can carry it on a horse you can hit the target if it doesn't penetrate the target or if you miss it's going to break off and not hurt your horse who's a whole lot more important than you are mm. so the lance and it's nine feet long it's barely able to fit here the butt piece that one was for a socket that was on the holster the uh, uh, saddle the other two is a rounded and a flat tip butt cap which basically keeps the spear from splitting mm. but the evolution of pole arms from agricultural tools is the really interesting story of these um, it is incredibly complex it is hard to follow in places one of the best ones the easiest to follow is the halberd which is basically axe on a stick. <laughs> At one point, literally, cleaver on a stick. The Vosges, one of the first halberds. It's not a halberd yet. It's what evolved to a halberd. halberd. What is it? It is a butcher's cleaver used to kill oxen. That's why they used the big one. And they put it on a stick. Because what's a horse? A pretty oxen. Okay, that son of a bitch on the back of the horse is trying to kill me. I'm going to forge a point on it. And I'm going to kill him first. The Swiss love this thing. They went into heavy, heavy training with it. Swiss halberdsmen were the top-end mercenaries of the medieval world. Second only... Second to them was the Germans, and they carried a halberd. And this is this is the German halberd, a more evolved weapon. The evolution had made the spearhead longer, more slender, more easily able to penetrate an armored target. Uh, the hook, the back end, this lets you catch the guy, catch the armored knight, pull him off the horse. And the axe, well, you can figure out what the axe is. <laughs> the Swiss version, roughly the same period, little more evolved, heavier spear, tends to have a pierced face. This is what you will see today in the hands of the Swiss Vatican Guard. Because the Swiss were known. They were the mercenaries. They guarded the Pope. And they guarded him with halberds. Hmm. But more weapons get involved in, in the mix. There's the English bill. Uh, this whole thing came about because I was trying to come up with an English bill. And I couldn't get one that I could afford. <laughs> but I have the agricultural tool the English bill came from. It's okay if you don't know what the weapon is I'm talking about. It is like a halberd. It is so close to a halberd it's actually hard to say which is what. Except the English bill has a heavy hook on the back. And it's sharp on the inside. You can cut with it. And you will bring that guy right off the horse. Or, any horse people here, put your fingers in your ears. <laughs> you can hamstring the horse. You can bring the horse down. Mobility kill on the end. Yes, I know this guy here who argued with me on this, God damn it. Uh, <laughs> the Jisarm, this, the more involved they get, the more complicated the history is. And you can have the same weapon in multiple countries under different names. The bill was really the British weapon. It came from the brush axe, which is what we're going to bring, which is just a hooked axe. And, uh, uh, you can look it up online as a limb trimmer for trees, okay? So this has the hook of the bill. This has the back point of the um, 
halberd. This has guards to keep the overpenetration down. This has the spear point. This is cutting edge. What the hell is that? Uh, it's nine feet long. It does seem like overpenetration is not a huge risk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, horse person, put your fingers in your ears. <laughs> kill him through the horse. <laughs> now, knights had a tendency to wallop on each other a lot. Uh, trial by combat. Very big deal. You don't really want to kill each other. Unless it's like a really good movie. Prince Lancelot. You know, crap like that. Um, they came up with different weapons for ground combat. Foot combat. Fighting in the lists. One of these things was the pole axe. Now, why is it called a pole axe? Is an axe on a pole? No. It's an axe on a stick that you attack the other person's head, called the pole, with two L's. And they too got involved. Here's a pole axe. It has a hammerhead. It has a spike. It has an axe. It has langettes, as many of these do. And it has a pointed butt. What does all this do? Spike, heavily reinforced. It will go through armor especially if you really put some ass behind it. And it's an armored knight holding it. So he's got his armor giving him the ass. The hammer dents the armor, smashes into it, mobility kill. You can also win the fight without killing the other guy, which the guy who uses all you knights as his master troops prefers you not to kill the other guy. The axe, oh well, shit, stuff happens. <laughs> the langettes, which are the long straps you'll see on many of these uh, pole arms, they are to prevent the opposing soldier from using his sword to cut off the head, which results in a stick. Mm. The separate axe head is another example. This one got nastier. It has side spikes that go out sideways, mm. so you can't grab the head. Weren't they just lovely people? <laughs> Bingo. Are there any questions, please? Mm. Yes, ma'am. Um, the rate Ciarius, was that ever used in combat, or was that just Oh, I'm sorry. No, well, yeah, my father did. <laughs> <laughs> this is a trident. It is an evolution of the killing weapon used in the gladiatorial arenas, which was an actual three-pointed, hence try. This is a seven tine, these are tines, just like tying up a pork, heavily spiked, incredibly sharp. They're oh, reading that head is way the hell up there. And it is used for fishing. And my father took out a 54-inch muskie for that thing. Oh. Yeah. Hence my father's weapon. Um, this is simply an application of a pole arm for what is, in effect, a peaceful purpose. Um, if you want a little detail, do a hole, in, a little, little rod. That's so you can stick it in the ice and it sits by the hole. <laughs> and then the fish comes in and you go, eat ya. Mm. Okay. Yes, sir. I know some Mediterranean cultures wrapped a cord around their uh, javelin, then threw it so it would spiral. Do you think that is more or less effective than an atl, -atl? Um It is less effective than an atl, -atl because of the uh, solid nature of this. However, um, you ever throw an arrow? Okay, you can't throw them very far. Mm. This is a plumbata. This is the world's most dangerous lawn dart. <laughs> <laughs> the Romans used this. Um, nasty son of a bitch. Uh, less than two feet long, iron head, <laughs> weighted, weighted, spiked uh, point. But this is all one piece. And there's two ways to use it. 
One is throw it up in the air. It's going to come down. What are you going to do? You're going to fucking die if you don't do something. Lift your, lift your shield up. They carried five of them. Shields up. Thunk. Okay, stop that. Whatever it was, stop it. So that's, this is the, what I call the smallest spear. I have a lot of fun with this. But you could take an arrow, I mean, literally an arrow shaft, with no fletching. And you take a piece of string with a knot in it. And you lay it across so that the knot is under the string. And then you spiral the string around it. You tie it around your finger. Hold it by the head and throw it. The string's going to unwrap. It's going to cause the arrow to spin. Remember, we took the fletching off. It's going to stabilize it, and you've just doubled the length of your arm. But you don't have the additional weight of the atlatl, so it's not as effective. As a matter of fact, they would hang stones on these to make them heavier, hmm. which made it more effective as a thrusting piece. But yeah, that's throwing arrows. It's actually quite effective. It looks foolish as hell, and you can win bets with it. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. When they closed the distance, did they tend to ditch the pole arm or the hafted weapon? They were gone. No, they, they're... Um, a spear is a thrusting weapon. A pillum is a javelin. That's a throwing weapon. Um, and then a lance is a horseback weapon. So this is a long thrusting weapon, a shorter thrusting weapon, a throwing weapon. So they would discharge their long-range weapons and then close. So pikes and spears? A pike is just a long spear. Right. A pike didn't get thrown. Had whole units of troops, right? Yeah. So well, what it was is a pike would be out there, and you hold bottom with your foot, it's dug into the ground, and you've got 12-foot long stick with a sharp thing on the end of it, a spearhead. And no horse is coming through 30 pikemen with that bristling hedgehog because that's only the front row. The next row has got theirs down, and the only difference is theirs are four feet shorter. And then the next row has theirs down, and theirs is eight feet shorter from that first row, which means you're looking at a bristling hedge of steel. And it's, bye guys. Uh, the pikemen uh, controlled the battle. It Pardon? could also be used in an offensive formation. I mean, you very accurately described them as a defense, the pikes. Mm -hmm. But they could also be used in an offensive formation. They could well, march with the pikes. As the I showed you earlier with the. Um, Riapaton, you just march with the damn thing out there. What are you going to do? <laughs> Get around the flank. <laughs> yeah. Or are you going to stand there with the British long going, oh, bye now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, someone? Uh, yeah. On pole axes, do all of them have squared points at the top? Uh, that's the strongest. All that I've seen have something like that, but no. It is not called a spear. It's a spike. So they could be rounded, but I don't believe they are flat like a spearhead simply because there aren't any that I've been able to find, which doesn't mean I found them all. Yes? What happens when two pike squares met? They stood there a lot. <laughs> <laughs> they nothing stood you, there a nothing lot. Nothing you can do, really. Nothing you can do. Esprit de corps, the first one to falter, would lose yep. three times as many men on the road. And you make them falter by your archers. <laughs> You just yes. poke at each other. Was there anything particular about the pole construction itself? Like um, straight, hard wood, well seasoned. <coughs> Green wood would warp and bend and stuff. So the material, are you talking, is like ash or something like that? No, it was simply a good, dense grained hardwood. Thank you very much, ladies. Yeah, thank you. Okay, enjoy. <laughs>